Today, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Exodus. Exodus chapter 33. But before you uh, get there, I want to give a little introduction to this message. Uh, just to give you the context and let you know uh, the setting for this so that you'll understand more uh, clearly what's taking place. Uh, Moses has been on the mountain with God receiving not only the Ten Commandments but the instructions for the whole religious system. Uh, the tabernacle and, and the intricate design of that, the Levitical priesthood and how they specifically are to function, and uh, the, the laws that they are to follow, all of this has been revealed to Moses on the mountain. But while he is up on the mountain, the people down in the valley have gotten discouraged. They've lost focus because their leader has been away with God, and they are wondering what is going to happen. And so they begin to talk among themselves like people do when they uh, aren't certain about what's going to happen. And uh, there is this idea, well, you know, we don't know what's happened to Moses, uh, so we need a God to follow, a God to worship. And uh, I don't quite believe Aaron's explanation. He said, I asked the people to, to bring uh, their ornaments and the jewelry, and they threw, we, I threw them into this fire, and out jumps a golden calf. Uh, <laughs> uh, probably a little more involved than that. But nonetheless, the people turn away from the God who has revealed himself so marvelously for the past couple of months in leading them to Mount Sinai. Remember, he has, he has um, provided them manna from heaven. He has provided water from the rock. He has, he has provided for them to be there, uh, not to mention the parting of the Red Sea and, and all that went on to, to get that whole trip started. He has provided every step of the way down to Mount Sinai, and now they've been misdirected and misfocused for 40 days, and they get off track, and they sin grievously against God. And uh, God calls attention to what is transpiring down in the valley to Moses and Moses gets up and runs down, and Joshua is at the foot of the mountain waiting, and or I, he's at the, he's on the mountain, been on the mountain, but not not near where Moses was. But anyway, as he's as they're coming back to camp, um, Joshua says, "Sounds like something's going on. Like maybe there there's an enemy invading or something." And uh, Moses says, "No, it sounds like celebration to me." And they get, of course, there and find that all the people are in this uh, orgy uh, and idolatrous worship, and it's, it's just a sad situation. And of course, God comes in judgment upon a portion of the people there that day. And of course, uh, if you go back to Exodus 29 while he's on the mountain, this is what God tells him. In uh, verse 42, there shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak with you, and there I will meet with the children of Israel. This has been God's purpose and God's design all along. Remember in the Garden of Eden, when God created the man and the woman, he created them for fellowship. And he came and fellowship with them in the cool of the evening, remember? And that fellowship that God wants, he is establishing here with Moses and these people. That's his desire to meet with us, to have fellowship with us. The God of the universe wants to be a part of your life and my life. That's amazing. 
But the problem, as I've mentioned before in other contexts with other relationships, is this. It takes two people to make a relationship. How many does it take to mess it up? One. And, of course, <clears throat> when we're talking about a relationship with God, we can be certain of one thing. God never will. He'll never mess a relationship up. So um, if you don't feel close to God, guess who moved? This is what he says. And they shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 46 their God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord, their God. That's his desire. And then we come over to chapter 32, and we find that they have done this, this terrible thing of turning away from God. And uh, they, are, they are messing up the relationship because God will not dwell with a people who turn away from him who sin. Now I want to ask you a question today uh, that you need to consider. Have you been feeling the closeness of God's presence in your life? Or have you been feeling that His presence is absent? Now, if you're a Christian, we know that the Spirit of God dwells in you, and He has not withdrawn His Spirit from you. But I do believe, like the people here, you can sense that God is not present with you the way He once was, that there's something missing, that there's an absence that, that you're feeling in your life, and you're wondering why. Well, this is what the Lord says to Moses in chapter 33, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it, and I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up with in your midst. Whoa, wait, wait a second. Go to the land, but I'm not going to go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. <clears throat> the word stiff-necked is another word for stubborn. Now, I know we don't have any stubborn people here. They didn't show up for church today, but you can tell them I talked about them, okay, when you see them. Let them know. <clears throat> A stiff-necked people that wanted to do it their way and not God's way. You know anybody like that? Want to do it their way and not God's way. God says, I'm not going to be in the midst of that. Then he says further, um, when the people heard this, this bad news, they mourned and no one put on his ornaments. Now, where did this golden calf come from? What did they do to get this golden calf? The, the, go, the ornaments were thrown into the fire, cast into a golden calf. And now they're, they're putting away their ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are stiff-necked people. I could not come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Or I could come up into your midst, excuse me, in one moment and consume you. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Let me tell you what you need to do. When you know you have sinned, you need to cast off that sin like they cast off their ornaments. 
Repentance is about turning away from what you know is wrong, what you know is hurting you and hurting God, what you know you shouldn't be involved in. You must turn away from it. God is going to decide what to do with you based on what you do in response to your sin. Are you going to turn away or are you going to continue? That is the question that God puts before these people here about the ornaments. Because the ornaments, that was the beginning of their sin when they gave those ornaments, that jewelry up so that the calf could be made. That was the beginning of their idolatry and they must turn away from that. So they put aside their jewelry because that's what the Lord had told them to do. And because they responded that way, and they, it says in uh, verse 6, so the children of Israel stripped themselves. The, literally, they spoiled themselves. Remember when they were leaving, leaving Egypt, they were spoiling the Egyptians of that jewelry. And God had a better design for that jewelry. What, what will that jewelry ultimately do? What will it ultimately be used for? Well, if you read about the tabernacle, you'll know. A lot of gold and silver and brass is going to be used to build the tabernacle and all the furnishings to worship God. God, God gave that to them when they spoiled the Egyptians and the Egyptians gave all that to them. It was for the purpose of worshiping God, not worshiping something else. And so, uh, because they're willing to do that, God relents concerning being with them. And Moses, uh, this is how, this is how it's, it's come to a head. Moses took his tent, verse 7, and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. Now, this is not the tabernacle of that uh, they will construct. This is Moses' tent that he has designated the tent of meeting for the purpose of God meeting with his people, but not, not here in the midst of them, but where? Outside the camp, far from the camp. So if you're going to meet with God now, instead of experiencing His glory here, where are you going to have to go? Out to where the tent of meeting is. Out to where the glory cloud descends. Out to where God comes and meets with Moses. And listen. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out of the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, the, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. So, in essence, what we see happening here is we see um, Moses revealing the, the, that because of their sin, God is no longer dwelling with them as he once did. And so in order for them to meet with God, they're going to have to make extra effort. They're going to have to go to the tent of meeting. They're going to have to seek the Lord. I'm, I'm going to talk to you just real frankly. If your spiritual life isn't what you want it to be, isn't what you feel it should be, 
No pastor can solve your problem. No church can solve your problem. No worship service can solve your problem unless you are willing to do something, unless you are willing to seek the Lord. The Lord says, I will be found if you seek me and search for me with all your heart. And in this culture and in this generation, I see people searching Searching for something, not God, but because they're not going to find him where they're looking for him. Anyway, that's what they're looking for. But I see people searching in so many different places, in so many different ways to find deep satisfaction, and they will not find it in the world. You will not find it in any other place than in Jesus Christ and in God the Father. And the Holy Spirit, you will not find it any other place. It can be found in no other place because we have been created to have fellowship with God. And without that, nothing else will fill our lives with meaning and satisfaction. So... What I'm hoping is that this revival will be an opportunity for you to once again seek the Lord with all your heart and desire for something more than you currently have, than you presently have. Now, I don't know if I'm going to finish this sermon because uh, I've still got some things to say to you, but I may have to postpone that. I just want you to get the idea that that revival is about deciding that you aren't where you need to be with God, but you want to be. Revival is about looking back at your life and remembering times when you were closer to the Lord than you are now and realizing that's not where you want to be. That you want to be closer to him. And what a, what a relationship Moses had with God. It says here, now, when it says that Moses talked to God face to face, and later on it'll say that, that uh, Moses can't see God's face because if he were to see God's face, he would die. The expression that he spoke to him face to face really is kind of like mouth to mouth. That You know how two friends communicate? Well, I'll tell you how. I, I had a... I had a guy one time I worked with that I considered a friend, but he had this expression that just constantly annoyed me. Uh, when we were going to talk about something difficult, when we were going to talk about something that was uncomfortable, he would always say, now, let me choose my words carefully. You know why that annoyed me? Because if you're really friends... You can say anything to me, and if I misunderstand or don't understand, we'll talk it out. If you're really friends, you don't have to choose your words carefully because you know that whatever you say, this person is not going to just turn his or her back on you and walk away from the friendship just because they misunderstood something you said. If they do that, they weren't really friends to begin with. A friend will hear you out. A friend will listen carefully. And if a friend misunderstands, if you say something like, oh, I'm so angry at her, I just wanted to pull her eyes out and stomp on them. Seriously. And you say, okay, okay, are, are you serious about that? Do you really want to pull their eyeballs out and throw them on the ground and stomp on them? Well, no, I'm just, I'm just angry. Or maybe, yes, I really mean that. Either way, you're, as a friend, you're going to talk them, talk them through that. Say, so you, you don't really want to do that. You really don't mean that. But friends talk to one another, and they share what's on their heart with one another. And that's what God and Moses were able to do. I read in the Psalms, I read some pretty interesting things in the Psalms because I read 
more than just a couple of them. I like to read through the Psalms. And there's some pretty difficult psalms where, where people say things that I'm not sure they really meant <laughs> to God. But you know what? God understands. God knows their heart. God hears what they're saying. He hears them out. He even sometimes corrects them in their thinking. If you're a friend with God, you can say anything and he'll understand. Are you a friend with God? You can be. You know, Jesus said his, to his disciples, you are my friends. You are my friends. I've called you friends. Abraham was a friend of, with God, and Moses here is God's friend, talking to him face to face, as it were, just out in the open, laying it all out. That's one of the ways that Revival is stirred when you pray, when you talk to God, when you're, when you're not, okay, here's some of you when your prayers, you're carefully choosing your words. Now, maybe that's something that you are particularly guilty of when you're praying in public, but I just want you to know that with God, you don't have to choose your words carefully. You just lay your, your heart out, bear your heart before God, tell him your concerns, tell him your worries, tell him your, your fears, tell him your needs, tell him whatever's going on in your life. He already knows anyway, but you tell him because he's your friend and he wants you to. And the glory of the Lord was revealed there at that tent of meeting, just as it has been, has been at the, the, mountain just as it had been in other places it, as that cloud had stood between them and the Egyptians and that cloud had led them through the wilderness that cloud representing God's presence and his his glorious presence so it was here at the tent of meeting now next week I'm going to tell you how you can have that kind of relationship. But I, I just want you to, to this morning to, to ask yourself, have I been like the Israelites and allowed something into my life that has hurt my relationship with God so that I don't sense his presence in my life as I once did? Maybe you are where you need to be and want to be with God this morning. Maybe you do sense his presence and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is in you and with you and for you. Maybe that is your testimony this morning. But if not, let me also tell you something else. Just like when Joshua led the people of Israel into the promised land and they were supposed to completely destroy everything in Jericho but one man Achan thought nobody was watching thought that he could just take a little bit of the the bounty of the boot booty of the of the spoils and he could just steal them away and hide them in his tent and no one would know and, and nobody would be the wiser, and it really wasn't that much after all. But because of one man and one man's sin in the camp, that affected the effectiveness of the nation Israel. One man brought a nation to defeat because of his sin. One man destroyed his family because of his sin. And one church member can hurt a church because of his or her sin. One member can bring our testimony down. One member can destroy our effectiveness in the community. One person and one person's sin. It doesn't take much, does it? 
It may not seem like such a big sin to you. It may like seem like nobody else knows about that sin. It may seem like it shouldn't be a big deal, but to God, sin is a big deal. And sin hurts, maims, and destroys the people of God. Hear me. Please hear me. Please know that we are serious here with God. Please know that there are people who, who are going to fall on their knees and, and pray for God's blessing and for this church. We've been here 21 years, and it's only by God's grace. But for us to continue in God's blessing, we must have repentance to continue in God's blessing, we must have people who are seeking God's face more than anything else. To continue in God's blessing, we must forsake what is holding us back. Let it go and move forward with God. Do you want that? You know I'm not going to be here forever. You know that some, some of you will be here a lot longer than I will. But my heart's desire is that God move like he has moved in, and how I've seen him moved in, move in the past. I want to see him move in this church today. I want to see a movement of God. I don't want it to be Dan's movement or New Beginnings movement. I want to see God move. And touch hearts and draw people into his presence. And I want to feel the presence of God here like a cloud. You know, there, the word for glory in the Hebrew means heavy. And you know, when you feel God's presence in a place, there's a certain heaviness. You feel it. You know that he's here. You know he's in your midst. You know it. You can't see it, but you know it. You feel it. There's a certain solemnness, a certain seriousness that you feel because you know God is here and you feel that. I want to feel that. I want to feel that. That's what makes life worth it. It's not about all the stuff I can gather. It's not about all the money I can make. It's about knowing that God is with you and you are sensing his presence and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that nothing else really matters but that. I want that. And I want you to want that. Can't make you want it, but I want you to want it. Let's pray.